Way to go. So, hey, if you're a, a guest, we especially welcome you. I want to add to that. We've been walking through the book of Job. I had a lot of you who've recently confessed to me, Jeff, when you announced we're going through the book of Job, I was like, oh my gosh, no, I'm, I'm already beat down. And we come to church and we're beat down and you know, I'm suffering, I'm walking through some hard times. But, but you know what we've discovered as we've looked each week, we've kind of looked at this juxtaposition of, of heaven and earth. We said there's a conversation going on in heaven that Job doesn't know about. God's up to something. We look at good and evil. Last week, we looked at answers and questions. And today, we're going to look at man and God. Really, the relationship that we have with God in light of it all. And we've actually discovered that it's not so much about evil and suffering. It is about that. But it's really about worship is what this book's about, which is so powerful, so amazing. Um, I want to ask you this. In fact, you can go ahead and turn to uh, Job 38 is where we're going to be. But uh, students, you ever found yourself maybe even recently in a class where, uh, you know, generally you're asking questions of the teacher or if you don't understand something. You ever been in a class where you don't even know the question to ask? You're so lost. Anybody? Um, I've been there. I mean, for me, like I remember, uh, I've shared this story before. I was sitting at a rehearsal dinner at a wedding with Stacy and I were there and I was doing this wedding and I was sitting beside this gal I'd never met before and she's in her twenties or something. And I, and I said, um, wow, cool. What do you study? And she was in school. And she said, she's getting a doctorate in math. And I was already kind of impressed because I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I've never been real good with numbers. And she said, oh, well, we, we don't use numbers anymore. And I was like, um, I'm out. I don't even, I don't, I don't know what to ask, right? I'm like, um, how about them cowboys? <laughs> you know, something. Because I'm like math without numbers. That's like words without letters. I mean, that's like a book without words. I didn't even know. I mean, like I'm totally lost. You ever felt that way? Some of you students may feel that way in some classes now. Keep pressing on. Ask your parents. And now they probably can't help you either, but, but get some help, right? We all need help. And we ask questions sometimes. And we, sometimes we don't know what to ask. And what, today we're going to find Job uh, before God. And he has been uh, kind of arguing for his, you know, the fact that, man, I don't deserve this. And his friends all through the, those chapters in the middle of the book where it gets pretty dense, they're basically saying the only theological framework we have here, you must have done something wrong because God is just, this is how it works. And we've talked about this, that a lot of people believe worship is just a law of reciprocity. Life is, if I do good, God will bless me. If I'm not good, God will punish me. And that's the only framework they had. And Job kept saying, I'm telling you I've been pursuing him. And even God says that he's blameless and he's innocent. So he doesn't know even what to ask anymore. And so then the tables turn. Throughout this book, um, there's a lot of courtroom kind of language. He's been wanting to state his case before the judge. He's been wanting to bring his own case and say, listen, I wish I could stand before God and I would ask him some questions and then he would answer me. And in chapter 38, Job gets his wish. Uh-oh. But you know, standing before God and asking him questions is a lot like what I saw this week. Maybe you saw this and went viral. It, Walter the dog who's complaining <laughs> to his owner. Watch this. This is real. Listen to me. I told you why we can't go to the park. No, I told you. I told you why we can't go to the park. It's closed today because they're spraying for bugs. Do you want to live with creepy crawlers all over? I guarantee you don't. You really need to think about how you talk to me. You're disrespectful without even knowing my reasons why. You talk over me. You are allowed to have a, vo a voice here in 2018, you know? But it's like you're crossing the line on being disrespectful each and every time. <laughs> so, Walter, yeah, I mean, y'all, and but that pales in comparison to, to us coming before God. Like, God, let me tell you, I'm going. A lot of us, a lot of us, the only prayer that we offer to God, 
And God is like, oh my gosh. And what we see here, and I say that, he's much more loving than that. That's not what I would be. Parents, anybody, right? You're a little two-year-old whining, crying about something. And you, you're like, you don't even know what I know. And in the same way, here's the problem with Job. We're going to see it today. His God is too small, ultimately. Your God is too small. The anxiety, the worry, the struggles, many of, many of, of the things that you face today is because your God is too small. And what we're going to see here in, in chapter 38 are God's questions to Job. So let's, let's take a look, all right? So uh, Job 38, we're going to start with uh, these re- a repetition of rhetorical questions pounding away at him all the way from chapter 38 to 41. And I'm going to kind of go through these rather quickly. Here's the structure of the message. We're going to look at the questions that God asked him, and then we're going to shift gears, and we're going to turn to ourselves here in our day right now, what we know on this side of the cross, and we're going to answer those questions in light of what Christ has done. We know a lot that Job doesn't know. Now he knows that his redeemer lives. I mean, he proclaims it. It's crazy. We talked about this last week, but we know a lot more than he knows. Now of God's questions, uh, the rhetorical questions do what they're designed to do. They, they force you to internalize the question. Uh, you know, Jesus would often answer a question with a question because he wants us to discover what we can discover given this redeemed kind of you know, imagination, and for those of us who follow him, he, can, he will reveal to us by the Spirit. He asks him these questions. The first one is, who are you? Who are you? And really, this one is the essence of all the other questions. He shows up in a whirlwind. Chapter 38, verse uh, 1. Look at this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. By the way, it was a whirlwind that killed his family in chapter 1. He shows up terrifying. He shows up and he says this. Who is this? That darkens counsel by words without knowledge. He's saying, who, who, who are you? Then in verse 3, he says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Now, he says, dress for action. And this is literally, um, gird your loins. All right? Get ready to move. Uh, it's kind of, you know, put on your big boy pants. Because I'm about to ask you some questions. But he's being loving. I, I want you to know this. He's being loving to Job. He's going to put him in his place, but God does all this out of a heart of love. So he's saying, hey, who is this? And this question is not, he's not asking this because of his ignorance. God knows who Job is. He's asking it because of Job's ignorance. And look at what he says. I want to spend just a moment on this this first question because it, it helps all the others. It's like a domino effect. God accuses him of being without two things in verse 2. He lacks wisdom, okay, that's darkens counsel, and knowledge, words without knowledge. God has arrived to show Job, reveal to him, supply to him wisdom and knowledge to fix his ignorance. And the ignorance is is around, uh, how about this, Job is a lost sight of his relationship to God. Now catch this, God wants to know, who are you in relationship to me? That's what he's asking. All of these questions, even, and the the main one, who are you in relation to me? All the questions come in relation to God, right? See, wisdom and knowledge are essential for understanding our proper place before God. And and scripture doesn't really differentiate between knowledge and wisdom. If you have knowledge, then wisdom is applied knowledge. You can't have one without the other. And, and so here we see wisdom and knowledge is, is, is proven by showing that we understand our right relationship with God. That's important to understand theologically. So in Proverbs th- uh, 9, verse 10, it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. It was Socrates, the great philosopher. He said, wisdom begins with wonder. Wisdom begins with wonder. In other words, just this, you know, this questioning, kind of, kind of this awe and wonder. This sounds a lot like Proverbs 9.10. And what's going to happen now, some of you know, that, that God is going to take Job on a virtual tour of the universe. Uh, chapters 38 through 41. Dress for action. Be the man. Now watch this. Here's what he's saying. Act like a man. He's saying, look, you be man. You be a man. I'll be God. 
He doesn't say dress like an eagle, dress like a lion, dress like something else. Dress like a man, be the man, and I will be God. And here's the word for the Lord there. The word is Yahweh, the covenantal name of God. So he's saying, and you know what Yahweh means, do you know? I am who I am. Every other question comes out of who God is. Every answer to every question is found in God. He doesn't say, I am who you think I am. I am who I am. I'm the essence. I'm the center. And watch this, Job. You will be defined by who I am. I am who I am. You will be who you are. You see how this is all about a right relationship with him. I'll do me. You do you. And friends, listen, that's not just a little little cute statement. This is life. And I want you to think about what you're struggling with, the challenge that you're facing today. And as you go through the week, listen, this this will change your life. You do you. Let God be God. And so what what is this be me? We want to talk about this because the problem is we confuse these roles. And again, much of the the anger or worry or anxiety or resentment or lack of confidence, fear, is because you have a low view of God. Just like Job. You want your God to be manageable. I know I do. And then when he goes off and does something we do not anticipate or don't want him to do, we're like Walter. We're just whining, right? We all do it. I do it. I find myself whining before God, and then he, by his loving, gracious spirit, he says, okay, Jeff, 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 listen, listen, look, look at what I'm doing. Look at who I am. Look at how I love you. See, this is why this is so important. Your view of God determines your response to God. And this is what God's going to help him with. So the first one, the big question is, who are you? And then he asked, where were you? So there's this series of questions. Where were you? Look at, uh, look at chapter 38, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And we could spend a lot of time here and we won't. But he's taking him now on this trip. I don't know how this happened. I don't know if it's just God speaking to him. I imagine something more like watching this thing in IMAX. Or maybe it's more like um, experiencing all this as if you're on a ride at Disney World. Anybody? Like here, but, but more so. Like... You're experiencing this thing. And so God takes him out and he says, look, I want to show you something. I want to take you on a tour. Were you there when when I laid the foundation of the world? Were you there when I created all things? When I stretched the line across and said, here's how big the the world's going to be. Were you there when I I decided where the waves would stop in verse 11, where where the sea would go and where the land would come in? Were you there when I commanded the morning? To start, are you ever there when the sun comes up? Do you know where this happens? Do you know where the light comes from? Are you the one who's created all these things? So he keeps going on about, man, were you there when I created the world? And then the third question he asks, what can you do? So who are you? What, were you there? What can you do? Can you tell the sun to come up? You can see it in verse, uh, go, go to jump to verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? He's saying, do you know, and then on in 25, do you, do, do you know where, where, the, where the channel of torrents of rain have come? Have you, have you been to the Grand Canyon? Have you seen this? Have, have you seen, do you know where the thunderbolts come? And I love this in verse 26. We've noted, I'm, I'm gonna, I bring, lane, I bring, bring rain to, to, to land where no one lives. God is saying, I've got flowers. I have beauty across the planet and on the other side of the moon and and, and a billion worlds that you've never seen. And I see it all at the same time. I'm seeing all of this right now. Do you know what's going on in this universe that I've created? Have you ever been there? What can you do? I bring the rain. He says, do you know anything about the constellations in, in, in verses 31 through 30? Remember, this is 4,000 plus years before Christ. He's saying, do you know what I have done? Can you see who are you in light of me? And then fourthly, what do you know? Yeah, verse uh, chapter 39. Do you know when the goats give birth? I love that. Do you see the lion? Do you watch him? Can you, can you hunt with him? I see it all. Do, do you know when the babies are being born, when little animals are, are, are coming alive? Do you see the, the donkey who's just crazy donkey, li- wild animal? And then it's weird. He, he goes into this thing about the ostrich, which is hilarious. I mean, it's, there's some humor here, I think. I made a bird that doesn't fly. It's so stupid that he lays his, she lays her eggs. She doesn't even know where she put them. 
It's just crazy. Do you understand all this? I just did it because I think it's funny. You know, it seems. Um, what about the horse? What about, can you, can you tame a horse? Or do you know how mighty he is? How majestic he is? Verse 20 of chapter 39. What do you know? Do you know this? And then the fifth question, what have you done? What have you done? And so he, he plays him all the way out. And look at, look at chapter 40. Shall fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. And then in verse 3, then Job answered the Lord. Look at what he says. Behold, I am of small account. That's like, hey, I'm not worth much. I'm of little importance. What shall I answer you? I mean, he's really, right? He's like, oh, okay. I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. He said, I concede, I'm done. And then God says, I'm not, I'm not done. Okay, dress for action. He says it again. I'll question you. I'm not finished with you yet. I, I'm, I'm not done. And look at verse nine. Have you an arm like God? Now he asks, what have you done, big boy? Have, have you, look at this, have you adorned yourself with majesty and dignity, clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Are you like me at all? And then he goes into these two, it's some scholars think of some mythical character. I happen to believe that some kind of mighty beast, you know, almost like a, like a dinosaur or a dragon, he describes this, behemoth and then the Leviathan. And basically what God is saying, can you, can you tame, I mean, like saying to, you know, can you, can you catch a whale? I mean, can you just toss your rod out there in a hook and just pull the whale in? And God is saying, these are pets of mine. I created these little creatures and, and they, they will terrify you. They will destroy you in a minute. I can tame them and I tell them where to go. He's just saying, I want you to see who I am. Job, who are you in light of me? So now we know a lot that Job doesn't know. And we'll see how this lands here in a moment. But I want us to ask some of these same questions in light of what we know on this side of the cross. Now, I'm not going to assume that everyone here, you have a relationship with God through Christ, but I want to, 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 to just challenge us all. In Christ, we find the answer, all right? We find the answer. Notice I didn't say answers. The answer. Job learns that God is not the answer man. That's what God, God is saying. Look, you, you, you don't even know what to ask. I and mean, this is math without numbers. This is the, the new math of grace and, and worship. Jesus truly is the answer Jesus said to a group of Pharisees in John 5, he says, you guys study the scripture, you know all the answers, you got the answers to your questions, but you refuse to come to me. The scriptures point to me. And in the same way, God is saying, I am. The great I am. I am the answer, and you are who you are in light of me. So let's ask these same questions. Who am I? Well, God sends his son to be the most human human who's ever lived. We know who we're supposed to be. Because of Christ, we're to become like him. And it only starts as we have a relationship with him, as we're forgiven, as we enter into a relationship with him. You see, figuring out who I am is not a math problem to be solved. It's a relationship to be found. In Christ, in Christ, God has shown us the answer. And I love what it says in Colossians 2, 1 through 3. It says, listen to this, in Christ is all, check it out, wisdom and knowledge is what it says. In Christ, we find wisdom and knowledge. What is that? In Christ, we find who we are in him, in relation to God. In him, we find the ingredients of understanding. Now we know who we are. When we receive Christ, when we understand that he died on the cross for us, that he took on our shame, he took on our sin, and, and he, that he rose again to conquer death and hell. Who are you? See, without Christ, we're tempted. The only way you can answer that, it's a good question. Who am I? Well, let's see. I am, and you would, without Christ, we define, and we're tempted to do this. We define ourselves by what we do, right? I'm some of you students. I'm a, I'm a football player. I'm in the band. I sing. I'm, I'm a business person. I am. And we talk about our position, our success, the things we have. We're prone to define ourselves through those things. Instead of, how about this, what we've done instead of what Christ has done. And we all know where that leads. We, we define ourselves in relation to him. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were once alienated. We were separated from God, filled with shame, unforgiven. We were enemies of God. But God, it says, 
He has reached down and rescued us. He's defined us. He's forgiven us. He has set us free. He's accepted us. He's adopted us into his family. I wonder how many of you have seen the book. It's a book by Max Lucado. It's called You Are Special. Anybody seen this book? It's the book about the Wemmicks. The Wemmicks, anybody? So it's a story of the Wemmicks, all right? So there's Eli, who is the great uh, shop owner, and he's creating these little wooden creatures. Um, and he, sure enough, he creates them, makes them, and then he sends them out. The Wemmicks live below uh, the shop down the hill. They have this little town, and they live in this town. And what they do is they pride themselves on judging each other. They put stickers on some who are, who are really smooth skinned and beautiful and do great things. And, and then they put dots, gray dots on those who aren't, who don't look right or do, do crazy stuff, who, you know, who fail and aren't good. So they stick stickers. They have these little boxes. They go around and they put a sticker on somebody. You do something great, you get a sticker, you get a star. And if you do something bad, you get a, you get a dot. Punchinello becomes kind of the key creature, the key, the key guy, and he, he's not so much to look at, and he doesn't do much well, and they start putting gray dots on him, and then some people just come up and stick a gray dot on him because he's got a lot of gray dots. Everybody just decides who's going to be getting the gray dots and who's going to get the stars. And, and, and so one day, Punchinello meets uh, Lucia. Lucia has no dots and no stars on her. And Punchinello has never seen anybody like this before. He talks to her and says, what is the deal? You don't have any. And he, she explains to him, stars and, and the stickers, the dots, don't, don't stay on me. People try to stick them on me, stars and dots, but they don't stay. They just fall off. He thinks, I want to be like that. She says, well, you just got to keep going back to Eli. She tells him, that's what I do. I'll go back to Eli. So, so Punchinello, scared to death, decides that he's going to go back to Eli. He almost runs out when Eli says, hey, come here, come here, come here, Punchinello. And he says, you know my name. I know your name. I created you. And he loves him. And so what Punchinello does, he realizes the more he keeps coming back to Eli, those stickers don't stick at all. Because he's defined by his maker. He's defined in his relationship with Eli, right? Would this describe your life? And young people, we all struggle with this need for approval and acceptance. But I'm telling you, most adults haven't figured this out yet. And we, are, we have stickers on us, stars. Yay, I got a lot of stars today. Oh, I got some dots. And many of us just live in this life because we're defining ourselves outside of God. And God is telling Job, look, you define yourself in relation to me. So who are you? Who am I? Well, the Bible says in Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. You're sons and daughters of the King. Have you received Christ as your Savior? Friends, if so, you are a son or daughter of the, the Most High King. So who am I? I am a beloved son or daughter of God. Be reminded of that today. I've got a hunch that whatever reason you came today, You may have not been so centered on this, but this is why we come together. We're reminded again of who we are in him. I'm a beloved son and daughter of God. I can face the day ahead and and, and I will see myself in light of the cross. I'm totally forgiven, completely accepted by him. What can I do? Secondly, what can I do? I can live out of this identity. Look at this. If then, big if, you have been raised with Christ, if you've received his grace, seek the things that are above Define yourself by what God says, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your minds on these things. you got to be in his word. Be reminded and speak to yourself the word of God, the truth about you. That things that are above, not the things on earth, not stickers, not stars and dots. For you have died and you, your life is hidden with Christ in him. When Christ, who is your life, how about that? He's life itself. When he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He's saying, and this is where you're heading. So what can I do? Here it is. I can rest in him. I can rest in who he says I am, right? Thirdly, what do I know? Well, like Job, who says it later on, I know, or previously he says, I know that my redeemer lives in Christ. I I know who I am. I'm saved. I have a family. I'm, I'm a part of the family of God. I'm defined by his grace. I've been placed in a family and I'm gifted to serve him. I can rest in the fact that he's created me. What do I know? 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's stewards of 
God, of, or, or steward, good stewards of God's varied grace. I love that. His grace uh, given to all of us in various ways. It goes on to say, whoever serves, serves. It speaks, those who lead. Do it all to the glory of Christ. So what do I know? I am blessed. I'm called and gifted to serve God with my life. That's what I know. Well, where am I? Think about this. He's asking Job, where, where are you? Where were you? Where am I now? God told Job where he was. Think about this. Job is satisfied only when he's put in his rightful place. He's put in his place and he's finally satisfied in the end, as we're going to see. So God puts us in our place today. He's reminding us of who he is, lovingly putting us where we, where we belong. But not only that, he puts you where he wants you to serve him where he wants you to live. In fact, right now, some of us are complaining about where we are. God's put me here. I don't like this. He's saying, no, that's where I have you right now. Be all in. I remember Travis and I, my son went to, uh, went to DC when he we had kind of this coming of age trip together, father son trip when he was turned 13. And he wanted to go to DC because he wanted to go to the zoo because he wanted to see the pandas. All right. So we got there and we saw the pandas and it was awesome. But then we saw, I remember this one habitat, we saw the cheetahs. And the cheetah was in this pretty large habitat, but I was reading, you know how that is? You're watching the animals and I was reading it. And I was reading about how the cheetah can run 45 miles an hour in 2.5 seconds. They can run up to 65 miles an hour. And I was like, man, you're in the wrong place, bro. I mean, you can, he can't even run. And suddenly I felt really sorry for the cheetah. I'm like, this is awesome. I get to see him right here, but out in sub-Saharan Africa, he is kicking it. And I'm going, man, you don't belong here. And I love what it says in Psalm 119, verse 32. It says, I run in the path of your commands for you have set my heart free. Isn't that beautiful? Are you running? Are you in the place where God's put you? I would challenge some of us today to say God has put you right where you are to run in the path of his commands, to worship him. Where are you? I could put it this way. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart, that's where you are. And many of us are not treasuring the Lord above all else. We've lost our rightful relationship with him or our fellowship with him. We've, we've, We've made him too small. And yet God has placed you in the spot right where you are to serve him. So where am I? I'm where God has placed me. To serve him with my life. That's where you are. Wherever you are. Be all in. Bring glory to him. And then finally, what will I do? What will I do? We're going to close our time with a song. And we're going to sing together. But before we land, I want to show you how this whole thing lands. The band's going to come up and lead us. But what will I do? I'll give up being God. Can you say that before him? I'm going to give up being God. I'll be me. Frail, needy, weak, human that I am. And I'm going to stop trying to figure out everything. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, if you really want life, and here it is, you've got to die to yourself. And in John 12, verse 25 and 26, it says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. This is what I think God is telling Job. He's telling us today, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's say, hey, listen, let's measure what matters most, this love and hate thing, compared to loving him and who he is. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. Look at that. You know where you are. If you're pursuing Christ, wherever he is, that's where you are. You want me to go here? I'm going here. You want me to go? I'm over here. There's where you are. Oh, that's where you are. You want me to love this? Wow, you want me to forgive my spouse? My, you want me to, oh, I'm supposed to be here. Uh, why have you been over there? Where are you? Who am I? I'm a beloved child of God. Friends, be reminded of that today. What can you do? Rest in him. Get a proper view of who he is. He's bigger than all your problems. You need to be right-sized before him today. What can you do? You can be reminded that you're gifted, you're called, you're blessed. Where are you? You're in him 
and you're right where he's placed you. You know, in the end, I guess I'd say it this way, what, what will I do? Well, I will worship him. That's what I'll do. Worship him with my life. Because you know where this goes. In Job 42, he comes to the end of this book. And we got, we got more to unpack, but I just had to go here. Chapter 42. I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He says, your purposes can't be stopped. Friends, remember that today. His purposes can't be stopped in your life today. And he says, he repeats the question that God, I mean, yeah, that God brought to him. Who is, who is this that, that hides counsel without knowledge? Who, who needs wisdom and knowledge? And he says, therefore, I've uttered what I did not know. I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. I didn't know. And then he says, and you, you said here and I will speak and I'll question you and make it known to you. And he did. And then Job says something remarkable in light of chapter one, when he loses everything, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. You're going game over. But then he says this, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes, my eyes sees you. Now I can see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent. Job didn't get all his answers. He got something better. He got God himself. So let's, let's pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm just going to ask you to stay seated. And we're going to close in a song. It's going to remind us again how great God is. And how he's called us to worship him. Friend, if you needed to be right-sized today, just confess, repent, turn to him. Say, Lord, in my mind, you've been too small. You're greater than I can even imagine. I am who I am in relation to you. I commit myself to you. Friend, if you're here and you've never received Christ, I want to ask you, what's holding you back? By faith. Not by your works, praise God. Not by your works, not by how many stickers you have, stars, or even dots. He's released you, he's set you free. So Lord, as you've taken us on this tour along with Job today, if all the animals of the earth, if the stars worship you, if the planets worship you, <laughs> if even little Walter the dog worships you and makes us laugh, if all creation worships you, so will I. If you created me, I'll worship you. I will follow you. We worship you, Lord. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.